So hello everyone and welcome to this uh, GCSE Biology lesson on classification. So in this lesson we're going to talk about taxonomy, how we organise organisms, uh, both originally how the system was designed and then how it's been updated for a post-genetic genomic era. Okay, So you're expected to know a little bit about what taxonomy is, how we traditionally classify organisms and how those systems have been updated with new evidence. Okay, So this is the specification. As you can see there's a bit of new language on here. You're supposed to know the work of Carl Linnaeus, who um, basically divided life into a series of, of tiers, of strata, right, of little layers, and they have names. They're kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Okay? You're also supposed to know that the last two of those, the genus and the species, make up the Latin binomial name of all organisms. Okay? More on that in a moment. You should also then understand that obviously he was working in the 1700s, so things have moved on a little bit since then. With the advent of genetics, uh, we have ended up with a much more nuanced understanding of how related organisms are, and we can now construct very accurate genetic trees, Okay, as they're called phylogenetic trees. The idea being that we can not only tell which animals are related to which and how closely, but how long ago they speciated. So. On that note, right, a little recap here of uh, speciation, okay, a little recap of speciation and the idea of what we actually would consider a species. Because all these systems, right, are human made, right? They are literally us trying to organise and classify life, okay? Life doesn't care what categories we put into it, the organisms on the planet don't care. Um, this is really so we can make sense of it. So all these systems are human invented things. So let's return to this idea. What is a species? So we know there's variation. We know organisms look different to each other. And within one species, they all look different as well. We've covered that in a previous lesson. So when does it get to the point that this variation is so great that we've actually got two different species, two different species right? We've got speciation taking place, taking place. So defining a species, OK? Now, I know I've shown you these pictures before, but these are two examples I use. We both know that we all know those things in the top there are dogs, right? But they're showing huge variation. These things down here, tulips of course, but they are also showing huge variation. So our definition that we use, and it's not a perfect definition as we've discussed in previous lessons, is a species is a group of similar organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And that's essentially the definition that we're going to use going through today's lesson. So classification, as I said, is our attempt to organise life, to put it all into different categories, different boxes to make humans happy. So we can get an understanding of what is going on in ecosystems and on our planets. OK, so it's the process, as we say, of organising life into groups that we can understand. Now, for most of the time that this has been done, that humans have tried to do this. We've been relying on what I would call the old fashioned ways of doing things, which are, does this thing Look like this thing. How many legs have you got? How many legs have you got? You got four. You got four. Right. You're in one group. You got no legs. You're over there with all the other slimy things. Right. So that's basically the sort of way. Obviously, a bit more nuanced than that. That's the that's the way that classification has been done historically, and this kind of became absolutely um, sort of really really well refined in the great museums, particularly in Europe and the Natural History Museum in the Victorian era, when explorers were going out around the world, bringing back specimens, going, "What do you think of that? What's that then?" and very detailed measurements were taken and so on and so forth. The new style, however, is to use genes, use genetics. We've already spoken about um, mutations in previous videos, mutations and changes in genes and genes creating proteins and all that kind of stuff. Now we can look at genetics, we get much better comparisons of the organisms and actually can work out quite a lot of ways that the old fashioned ways, as brilliant as they are, were wrong in places. Okay, so that's also led us to be able to construct amazing uh, trees, amazing linkages, amazing sort of what we call genetic trees, the so-called tree of life. And here's one such example. And I've got to split this over, over two slides. I tried to animate it for you, but in the first step of this, I overloaded my graphics buffer because it's just that a big idea, right? So here we've got down here the idea that 3.8 million, 3.8 billion years ago, and that's a little bit outdated now. We now think life goes a bit further back than that to maybe 4.1. Um, that's the first sort of signs of life. And it was single celled, your sort of bacteria, your typical prokaryote stuff. And you've got all these examples around the bottom. As evolution, natural selection took its course, we started ending up with simple multi-celled organisms, things like sponges, sea fans, all that kind of stuff. And we're basically working our way around here up to uh, sort of 550 million years ago where we've got um, Cambrian explosion, 
We've got a bunch of familiar organisms down here, things like jellyfishes, nautiluses, various mollusks, all these kind of different organisms. Some of our more familiar invertebrates, the trilobites, uh, the ammonites and trilobites come in around this point, which obviously we've um, already discussed in previous lessons. Okay, so those then later lead to these four great branches, these four great groups that are coming off the top here. Okay, and I must not get too excited and forget where the limits of my box are. Ooh. Right, so these four great groups go as follows. Okay, we've got animals split here into invertebrates and vertebrates. We've got the fungi, okay, and we've got the plants over there, the modern plants. And these great groups give us all our modern organisms, the ones perhaps we'd be more familiar with from previous classification, you know, lower down the school or into primary school, okay? Uh, the vertebrates are massively overrepresented here because, of course, in the top there is the one we're all interested in, which is us. And there's Charles Darwin sat on his chair at the top there to illustrate humans. Now, this is only a fraction of the organisms that are alive, let alone the ones that are extinct, okay? Absolute fraction of the organisms. But it gives us an idea of just how complicated and interlinked all of life is, okay? Therefore, a classification system to sort this all out is gonna to have to be pretty robust, okay? So then let me introduce you, first thing, to the five kingdoms of life. This is kind of our first layer of organization, okay? So first thing we do, get presented with a new organism, right, is it A, a plant, B, a fungi, C, an animal, D, a protist, or E, a bacteria, okay? And that's kind of our first thing. That's sort of the high, what was thought to be the highest level of classification we could do. Now, we've also got the types of cell here, which we're going to come back to later in the lesson. Okay, the prokaryotes, eukaryotes. Now, below that comes a system of other words, right? These other taxon, as they're called, right? Which were, in, which were invented or proposed by this Swedish botanist called Carl Linnaeus, who was the first person to make a really successful classification system. It's now still the one that we use today, primarily, okay? He proposed that once you've sorted out what kingdom it's in, within each kingdom there should be phyla, within each phyla there should be class. So for example, a phyla might be whether you're a vertebrate or an invertebrate, if you're in the animals, okay? Uh, class then would be the things we might be familiar with from lower down the school, within the animals, things like um, are you a reptile, mammal, bird, fish, so on and so forth. If you're a mammal, um, the order here, might be something like, are you cat, dog, bear, what, what are you, primate? Um, and then family, genus, and species go even more specific. And these two here, the genus and the species, give us our Latin name. Okay, they're, they're basically double barrel Latin name that all organisms have got are just the genus and the species. And you are expected to know those words in that order for GCSE biology. Okay, so you need some way to remember it. All right, and the way I was always taught, by my teachers back at school, right, was KP crisps of fantastically good saltiness. So that's still the one I use today, even though uh, 20 years later we don't really have KP crisps anymore. Okay, so you might have to come up with something else, but whatever you do, uh, come up with a way of remembering this, of understanding this system, right? So you can remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, now uh, Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist and he's working in 1707 and to 1778, and he decided best language for all these terms would be Latin. Now you might be thinking, oh, why did he do that? Was he just trying to be fancy or posh? No, he was trying to be helpful because Latin has a number of advantages. One, in his era, if you were a scientist and you were educated, you spoke Latin. So it crossed over all language barriers. Okay, so the, the educated people all spoke Latin. So he basically did a Latin, could give them all Latin names and also Latin isn't changing. It's not a modern language that's evolving, changing, getting new words in it all the time. So the names he gave the animals would stay put. So they'd be understandable and they'd be static. OK, he could have been selfish and gone, I'm going to do it all in Swedish. And then, you know, the whole of life would sound like an Ikea catalogue. So we wouldn't have Homo sapiens, we'd have like Sultan Hugbu or some sort of thing. Right. And that would be no good at all. So here's his book. Right. This is obviously 1758. Uh, version. This was actually published in 1738, I believe was the, the first time, which is incredible because he managed to produce this when I think he was uh, in his late 20s, early 30s, which, you know, amazing work. Now, obviously, it's in Latin here, um, but you can recognise some of those words that we've already mentioned here. Look, you've got classes, ordines, so orders, genera, species, okay? Uh, obviously, that's all in Latin, but it doesn't take a genius to work out what those words mean. 
Okay, so let's give some examples so you know what I'm talking about. I think it's easier to understand through examples. So this is the full taxonomy of a certain animal, and I want you to work out what it is. Okay, so Animalia, it's an animal. Okay, so it's, it's, it's an animal that fits in with all the other animals. Chordata, it's cord, spinal cord, chordata, which is a vertebrate. Okay, so that means that it's either going to be a fish, a mammal, a reptile, a bird, or an amphibian. We're saying the class is mammalia, it's a mammal, so hairy, live young, all that stuff you probably did in year seven. Um, and then after that, we've got primates, so it's in with the monkeys, the chimpanzees, all the other great apes. And then hominidae means upright walker, and then homo sapiens is upright walker, big brain, okay? And that, you should know, homo sapien, right, that's your Latin name, that's you, okay? That's a human, okay? Homo sapiens. So let's pick a little slightly uh, more difficult one. So this is an organism that's been incredibly well studied right, by biologists because of genetics and because of all sorts of other inheritance um, experiments. It's easy to keep and it's easy to breed. right? So we go through again. Kingdom, Animalia. Phylum, Arthropoda. It's an arthropod, which means segmented legs. right? So uh, we know a bit about it there. And then the class within the arthropods, so exoskeleton, all that kind of stuff, it's an insecta. So it's an insect that tells us it'll have three body segments and six legs, which we should know from, again, classification in year seven. And of course, if you've ever played insects, head, shoulder, knees and toes, we all played that, which goes head, thorax, abdomen, leg, 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 right? It's a common party game, right? And then uh, diptera, right? Might get a bit hazy from this point. That means flies. So it's within the flies. And then if we come straight down, Drosophila melanogaster, basically is a fruit fly. You know those the annoying fellas that fly around your fruit bowl in the summer. Okay, that's a fruit fly. So that's the full classification. Now, even if you don't know all this bit down here, you can still work out quite a lot from the top of the, uh, from the, top of the taxonomy. Okay, here's another one, completely different form of life. Eubacteria, so it's not, um, it's not in the animals, it's a bacteria. Monera, single living bacteria. And then if we work all the way through, it's probably the most famous bacteria that there is, E. coli, right? Escherichia coli, colon living gut, coli for colon, okay? So that's that one there, okay? Which obviously is shown there with its DNA spilling out of it because its cell membrane's been burst, which is lovely. Right, so I want you to think about this for the rest of the video, right? As we go through, I'm going to give you the answer at the end. Pub quiz fact, what is the only animal whose Latin and English name are exactly the same. I don't want any repeats, I don't want like Rattus Rattus or Gorilla Gorilla, because we don't call Gorilla 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 Gorilla, we just call it a gorilla, right? So no repeats, so you're looking for a two word name, sounds a bit Latin-y, the only animal, and it is an animal, um, which has the exact same Latin name as English name. Okay, so to illustrate this reason of why we're using Latin, because it is a bit of a pain nowadays, have a look at this. What do you think this is? Okay, now this is obviously one animal in all these different languages. Okay, that is of course a lion. Now we call it a lion, right? And that is obviously you know, in English, but all these different languages have all different names for it. So that's obviously very confusing if you're trying to do classification that's international and universally accepted. But local languages rename animals quite often. Okay, languages drift. We're still doing it now. In fact, this was only yesterday. The idea that we're actually going to rename underloved fish for British tastes, right, due to Brexit, which is a ludicrous thing, right? The idea here that a particular form of sole is going to be called the Cornish sole now, and uh, spider crabs, we don't like eating spiders, spider crabs are going to be called Cornish crabs, so the British will, will eat them more. Obviously a nightmare if you're a taxonomist, if people just randomly start changing the names. I mean, if we're going to do this, I'll suggest a few more. Let's change the mackerel to be the freedom minnow and, uh, you know, the dab to be the uh, the arm gesture. We don't actually say dab, dab, we just do the gesture, right, like that. So obviously a nightmare if you're trying to classify organisms, okay? But Latin has the advantage of it's not changing because nobody's using it anymore, right? So here are the rules if you're asked to pick out or write a Latin name in a test or exam, right? The first name is the genus, okay? So that last two layers, genus, species. First name to genus, you write it with a capital letter. The second name is the species. You write it all lowercase, okay? 
If you're handwriting this, then you underline genus and species. If you're being asked to pick information out of a question, you can always spot the genus and the species by looking for the italics. They're always written in italics. So a really common question is, here's the taxonomy table. We've left the genus and the species blank. What is the genus and species of this animal? And you go back to the stem of the question and you look through and you go, oh, there's the two words in italics and you just bung those in, right? Two words, easy marks, okay? So for example, Human beings are homo sapiens, right? As notice, all these are, first word is the genus with a capital letter, and because it's typed, it's italics, second is the species, lowercase letter. Uh, lion, right, the Latin name rather than all those crazy other languages, Felis Leo, uh, rice plant, uh, or Oryza sativa, and colon bacteria, we already mentioned, is Escherichia coli or E. coli. With bacteria, because we tend to use the Latin names, we sort of shorten the genus sometimes and just put the, the, the letters, like Staphylococcus aureus, we'd often put as S. aureus. Right. So how do you decide these relationships? So that's what you write. Right. And there's a huge amount of data and wealth of information out there. But how were they decided? Well, we kind of mentioned this earlier. The old style is, does this thing look like this thing? That has got an incredibly uh, big limitation, which is that lots of organisms evolve to work in one environment. Okay, so they lots of different animals adapt to similar environments to look similar. Okay, if there is a best way to survive in a particular niche in a particular environment, then that adaptation is going to adapt, is going to appear quicker. So, for example, wings. Okay, now this is a, a, a bat, a bird, and a, a butterfly all have wings. The structures are kind of the same, they do the same job, they look those structural similarities but they're obviously very, very, very different evolutionary origins, right? One doesn't even have a skeleton, right? It has a skeleton on the outside, okay? One's a mammal, one's a bird, one's an insect. So huge differences, but convergently evolving to, um, to basically adapt to one environment or to adapt to one niche. And probably the best example of that is things that chase fish through the sea, right? So if you're a gray swimmy thing that chases fish and hunts that way, you could be a dolphin or a shark, or a penguin, or whatever it might be, okay? So here we've got our shark, our dolphin, our ichthyosaur, which is now extinct, our penguin, all massively different evolutionary origins. Sharks don't even have bones, they predate bony fish, okay? Dolphins are mammals, more related to you, right? And ichthyosaurs are extinct dinosaur relatives, penguins are birds. But look at the structural similarities. So this is the way that look, just look at it and work it out can go wrong, okay? The new style, it's called phylogenetics, a new keyword for you. It's how similar the things are to each other genetically, right? And we generate what we call phylogenetic trees. And they not only have the advantage of showing how long, uh, or what's related to what, but they also, because we know roughly how rapidly DNA mutates on average, we know how often it changes, Right? We know uh, sort of on average how many thousands of years it equals how many mutations. We can also get a rough idea of how long ago that speciation event happens. And we can build quite accurate phylogenetic trees like this one, again, which you could be promote, uh, presented with in an exam. So this is the dog family. Right, The black bear is in there for comparison. The black bear, as you can see up here, speciated way more than uh, 10 million years ago from all the dog families. Right but it's just like reading any other graph. Up here, you've got the number of millions of years ago that the organism speciated, and then these lines show the last common ancestor. So if you're asked, for example, how long ago was the last common ancestor of the gray wolf and the black-backed jackal? Well, you find the line for the gray wolf, you find the one for the black-backed jackal, you work it back, you come to this point here, you look at the the axis and you go well that's seven million years ago and there's your answer okay and this just illustrates where classical taxonomy got it wrong let's look at the number of things called foxes because if you're looking at things you know, four legs furry runny roundy bitey thing right might hunt things might scavenge yeah it's a fox chuck it in the bin called fox brilliant lovely but if you look for example at the crab eating fox versus the arctic fox we both called them foxes but if you have to go all the way back here all the way back you've got to go so between 9 and 10 million years before you find a common ancestor, okay? Now that obviously is not very well related, whereas something called a coyote and something called a grey wolf, completely different names, only you have to go back 3 million years, and for dog and wolf, right, 
very, very recent ancestry, it's between one and two million years. So the naming conventions don't always match up with what's actually there in the genetic history, which is why phylogenetics is so useful. Here's another example, look, um, supposedly the thing next to the person is supposed to be a whale, but illustrating the idea that we are so much more closely related to whales than we are to sharks and fish and so on. And whales are more related to us and indeed to crocodiles and birds than they are to sharks and fish. Okay, even though they occupy the same environment, chasey fishy, swimming around the oceany stuff. Okay, and that's what phylogenetics has given us. Now, the perhaps the most profound thing to have dropped out of phylogenetics was this thing discovered by this guy called Carl Vos in the 1970s, and his name is on your syllabus. That's how important this is. Okay, so what he was doing is he was studying the evolutionary relationships of prokaryotes. He was looking at bacteria, and this whole um, idea of looking at genes, looking at genetics was being pioneered at this point. He took on a project to sequence RNA, which is another nucleic acid within cells, in bacteria. Okay, and basically try and work out how it because they're massively understudied compared to the animals, because humans are selfish, right? We're anthropocentric. Um, he constructed what's called phylogenetic trees of prokaryotes. That was what he was trying to do. But he noticed there was this one group that really didn't fit. Now, you should know from cells that prokaryotes have got no nucleus, their DNA just flops around the cytoplasm, they're sensitive to antibiotics, they're very small, whereas eukaryotes are bigger cells, they've got membrane-bound things in them like mitochondria, chloroplasts if it's a plant, have got a nucleus, and that's a quite a clear distinction. He found a group of organisms that really didn't obey that clear distinction, okay? He noticed there was one group of the so-called bacteria, which up to then had been being called nephanogens, completely lacked a lot of the characteristics of other bacteria. And he said, well, this is actually this is big news, right? This is not bacteria or eukaryote. They're not prokaryote. They're not eukaryote. They can't go in either. Um, and this is even above kingdoms. So there's a whole new group of life, okay? And he proposed this idea, well, actually, I'm going to call these domains. And there's actually three of them. And we've missed one for the entirety of taxonomy, okay? So he proposed three domain theory. Again, that is on your syllabus. Three domains, basically, it's 1977 when he published this, he proposed this whole new group of life. And that's an incredible thing, you know, big, big thing to be proposing, right? He, what he noticed, look down here, was that yes, there are bacteria, yes, there are eukaryotes, as we've already said, but there's also this group that doesn't fit. They're called the archaea, okay? They're called the archaea, and that is what one of these big domains is now called, okay? And they're actually related to some of the Earth's earliest life forms. It's not even like they're rare. You've got a load of them in your gut. Again, they produce methane, so they're often called methanogens, although they're thought to be bacteria before then. You, uh, you also find them around hot smokers at the bottom of the ocean. You find them everywhere, so it's not exactly like they're rare, just no one had spotted them until we started looking at the DNA and the RNA. Okay, So here's again the, the phylogenetic tree of life with the archaea and the bacteria. You can see in the middle there those red ones. The archaea, a lot of them have got meth in the name, so they're methanogens. Okay, They're the, what we're talking about with the methanogens. Right. Why are they different? Well, there's a lot of things that make them the same as bacteria. So if we look up here, um, they don't have a nucleus like, like we do, so that's like bacteria. They don't have membrane enclosed, so those things like mitochondria, right, chloroplasts, they don't have those, so that's like bacteria. But then you start to get to these difficult things. Well, bacterial cell walls are made of this stuff called peptidoglycan, and plants are made of cellulose. So you'd think if it was a bacteria, it would have peptidoglycan in the cell wall, but archaea don't have that. Well, that's, you know, not exactly an um, ideal result, doesn't really fit, but we can probably overlook that. There are certain types of enzymes we're not going to go into. You can look into what RNA polymerase is through the ALOR videos if you want. Initiator amino acid, you don't have to look into that particularly, but that's different from bacteria. But the kicker, I'd say down here, look, is that we've got loads and loads of non-coding DNA in our, in our genomes, and bacteria don't. It's one of the big differences between us and bacteria. But archaea do have some of this non-coding intron or junk DNA. And then the last one, bacteria get killed by antibiotics. That's what we know. You take antibiotics, it kills bacteria. So when tested with uh, streptomycin, chloramphenicol, which are common antibiotics, bacteria die, their growth is inhibited. Our cells don't because they target bacteria, right? Archaea don't die in those conditions. So that, in that way, they're more like us. So they really don't fit. This is basically broken Linnaean taxonomy, okay? 
But we can't get rid of Linnaean taxonomy because every organism on the planet is named in this way. The genus is to, to undo that would be like telling everybody to stop speaking English or Spanish around the world and speak something else. It just wouldn't work. Okay, So we've had to tweak Linnaean taxonomy in the light of Carl Vos's discovery. And that basically, so that means we're going to have to tweak our mnemonic as well. Okay, So this is the update here. Above kingdom, we've now got another taxon called domain. Right Now, when I start doing that, my KP Christopher Fantastically Good Saltiness doesn't work anymore, so I've had to modify it. And the best I could come up with is changing it to Dem KP Crisps of Fantastically Good Saltiness. Right? But obviously, whatever you're using, make sure it's got a D on the front as well. So domain, kingdom, far, uh, kingdom phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, so in summary, to sum up what we've done today, um, we still use Linnaean taxonomy because it is so well embedded. We're still naming organisms under the Linnaean convention. Right, who gets to name them has changed slightly and, and local names and local languages are, are making it more in rather than using um, Latin entirely. Uh, the Latin name of the animal is its genus and its species. You can be asked to pick that out of questions or put that back into tables or whatever it might be. Genetics obviously has made this much, much, much better, has aided our understanding and added this whole new domain. Genetic trees show us what's related to what and how long ago two things species, uh, separated. How long ago two things speciated okay and you could be asked to interpret the genetic tree so that's basically what we've done today and just to finish off here's the end right of our pub quiz question so did you get an answer what is the only animal whose english name is the same as their latin name well let's go through its taxonomy i told you it was an animal it's phylum chordata so it's got a backbone so it's a vertebrate so that tells you it's either uh, mammal, reptile, fish, bird, amphibian, right? It's in reptilia, so it's a reptile, okay? So we're thinking lizards, iguanas, all that kind of stuff. Order serpent, serpents, serpientis, slithery, so it's a snake, okay? So it's in serpientis. The family Boidae, are we getting there? We're getting an idea now, if you didn't have one before. Boidae, its genus is boa, and its species is constrictor, right? It's the boa constrictor. That's the only one that's got the same English name and Latin name exactly. There it is. Okay, so hope that was clear and I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.